in northern Saskatchewan since that film was made. Um, currently, the NWMO, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, is still seeking a willing community in the north. Uh, there's also that group that had walked from Pine House down to Regina. They're still very active. Uh, and they've been writing to the Premier, they've been educating people in their communities, they've been talking to whoever would listen to say, we don't want this stuff, here's why. Um, recently they had an activist from Port Hope actually come to visit, this guy named Pat McNamara. I don't know if you've encountered this guy, but he's been um, writing letter letters to NWMO saying, why are you still here? These people are saying no. Uh, but there's been a quite a, a counter movement by NWMO to continue to try to influence the communities to say yes to these projects. And so they have people that they've hired who are on the payroll of NWMO from those local communities who are hired to be a liais, uh, liaison for the industry. Uh, and it's led to some real conflicts within the community and there's been a lot of talk about how the, the proposal is actually dividing communities. It's making neighbors uh, have arguments with each other. Uh, and it's led to some, some really sad uh, source of, uh, I guess, dialogues that have happened. There's a meeting where a guy named Jim Sinclair, who is on the payroll of an NWMO, uh, was addressing a young activist, a 15-year-old kid, who had been active to say, we don't want nuclear waste in our community. Uh, these communities in the north are places with high unemployment, lots of poverty, not very good job prospects. One of the main industries up there is the uranium mining industry, and so that that's the sort of dilemma that they face where they have a choice between no job or uranium mining and so there's been, you know, it's not much of a choice if that's your only option. Uh, but so this 15 year old was protesting against it in this context of high unemployment and high youth suicide rates, which was mentioned in the film. You had uh, the NWMO having meetings where they're saying, we're here to help you reduce your suicide rates. And they'll talk about suicide for an hour before they say, and then let's talk about the nuclear waste pr proposal now. So this 15-year-old is in a, in a meeting, he's a known opponent of the proposal, and this Jim Sinclair fellow says, you know, by the time you're 18, you're going to be in jail anyways, so go hang yourself with your Métis sash. And so it, it's gotten to the level of debate where it's actually, like, that's, that's cr almost criminal, I'd say. Um, he's telling a, a, a kid to go hang himself when there's suicides in his community. Uh, so it's getting it's getting bad up there. I'm not sure if at some point the provincial government will step in and say We don't want this in the province. They haven't done that yet uh, The premier has said in past interviews that he doesn't think the province will allow it through in the end But he hasn't come out to say there's any any proposal to stop it uh, There is a uh, some element I guess of uh, I don't know what it is, but not irony necessarily, but um, the whole not in my backyard kind of uh, thinking is, is problematic where uh, I think there's probably an argument to be made where if we're producing mining uranium, shipping it off, making money from that, why why aren't we somehow responsible for the, for the waste in Saskatchewan? Uh, and that, that fact has led people in the north dealing with nuclear waste issue to start questioning why the uranium mining is there in the first place. And there's a history that's, you know, 40 year history of activism against uranium mining in Saskatchewan. So there have been attempts to stop mines some mines have been stopped, but mostly the government goes on the side of the companies and pushes the mines through. Uh, but it's a, it's an interesting place. It's the only place currently in Canada that uranium is mined, northern Saskatchewan. Um, and you, you, I guess it, it seems apparent when you're up there why that might be the case. It's communities that are really isolated. Uh, I guess as the one person said in the film, it's, it's almost like people think no one lives up there but there are communities up there and they don't have a lot of political power uh, to resist these sorts of proposals so they've been placed upon them through the years. So that's that's kind of an update and a spiel on, on the nuclear industry in Saskatchewan, but I guess maybe questions uh, would be welcome for either of us. Um, well, I have made a very uh, conventional television documentary about climate change with the nature of things, and it, w it really felt after that that um, I wanted, because I come out of a background of experimental filmmaking, and my work before this had been about women artists, and um, that's kind of where I came from. But it really made me think of how you, how we can begin to engage in these larger debates in, in, in ways that are unexpected, because I think actually every weapon or style is important in discussing the ecological crisis, because it is a crisis. 
And I just felt, for, for me, I wanted to try. So the first dead ducks and carpe diem are kind of experiments and working with opera and working with animation. And they were really fun to do, and they were done, you know, for very low budget here, basically, especially Carpe Diem was, you know, my crew was student crew from York University, and we shot in the studio at, at York, etc. So they were really kind of experiments to think of, well, how could you use humor and irony and different kinds of methods to address these similar kinds of issues? Um, with Offshore, um, I think it was really, uh, it had started out being a more conventional film that was going to be exclusively focused on the deep water horizon, uh, and it was going to have some musical elements in it. But the more we thought about it, the more we thought we wanted to talk about the whole frontier, and we wanted to do it in a different way so that the form would be reflective of, of a different way of thinking. So, you know, one of our major concerns is to try to make our footprint as light as possible and that's why we decided just to do it on a web. So it's almost kind of immaterial. We're working with communities who have um, filmmakers in these communities. They're going to be sending us material. So this is just the very beginning of it. But it was really a way for us to think of, well, how could you work in a more participatory way and how could you do something that's engaging that would reach larger audiences where you don't have to have the physical object to distribute in a classroom that, you know, I mean, the problem with the web, of course, is that there's so much there, it's hard to say, we're over here, um, but we're working on different kind of strategies to do that. So that was the whole idea, and it's a bit of an experiment, too, working in an interactive, non-linear mode, because we're used to doing uh, films that have, you know, follow characters or follow stories, but, you know, I just feel we need everything. I guess uh, for for this film, and we're also so Mike Gauthier is the director. He he was the first guy to show up in the in the film. Uh, him and I are working on a full length film, and and this has sort of been a byproduct of that full length film, the, the waste bit. Uh, that that film, I think the style was a complete, uh, completely determined by our budget, which didn't exist. Uh, in two thousand nine, we heard about this consultation process that was going to happen in Saskatchewan where the government was going to go across the province from the very southwest to the far, far north, like basically border of the territories, and, and ask people what they thought about a proposal to build nuclear reactors in Saskatchewan, expand the mining, store nuclear waste, get a research reactor at the University of Saskatchewan, basically get into the nuclear industry, like the whole deal, not just the mining anymore, but expand the whole thing. And so we knew it was going to be important to, to be there to capture what happened and to act as a bit of a... I guess, uh, a witness to, to what's happening so that it wouldn't just be forgotten or misrepresented in the media and people's voices would count. Uh, but when we decided to do this, neither of us had any money. So uh, the style of guerrilla filmmaking is definitely coming out of the fact that we just, we borrowed, we borrowed cameras. I you know, put a car rental on my credit card. Um, we, we got some, some donations here and there. People would give us 50 bucks or whatever. Uh, we slept on floors and we just, Made it, made it happen. So we made it actually to 12 of the 13 communities that had consultations, and that's the footage we're now going to make into a, a full length. Um, but it's definitely a struggle. I don't know if it's recommended that you make a film. <laughs> <laughs> because we're, we're, even in the editing process, um, it's uh, you know, guerrilla editing too, I guess, where we're working at computers in our, you know, on Mike's, uh, Mike's house. Uh, he, he struggles to pay rent and all these sorts of struggles. Uh, but uh, I guess he, he keeps saying you can either be fast, um, good, or cheap, but it can't be all three. So I guess it's going to hopefully be good and cheap. Uh, it's, it hasn't been very fast it's been two, since 2009 since we've been working on this thing. Uh, but yeah, the gorilla, yeah, I think if, it'd, be, it'd be nice. Like, I, that, I love the, the interactive component, and I think that'd be a really nice way to present some of the stuff we've done on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on the web. We have a website, which I don't know if it's listed there, but it's just www.captainpower.ca. Um, so you can see we've, we've started to get a, a web presence, but it'd be neat to, to have people sort of explore these, these things. Because there's a lot to be said that you, know, you can look at nuclear waste for a whole 20 minute film or more. You can look at the, you can look at, uh, the power, you can look at the alternatives, you can look at all this stuff. Just well, I can answer really quickly. I was shooting in Louisiana and Alaska. They don't know anything about Canada at all, so no. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
so I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan, so that puts me a bit closer to this issue than, than living in Toronto. But, um, but it is a different thing to be from southern Saskatchewan and going up north to talk to people in the north. Uh, a lot of the footage in this film, when they're, some of the stuff, um, when you see them collecting water along the way, was shot by people on the walk who had cameras. Um, and then apart from that, uh, it's an interesting thing because I think on this issue, it's in Saskatchewan, it's divisive and uh, polarizing to some extent. Um, and so I think people are interested to know how you're going to represent them. And it's, uh, it's been a sort of a question we've had to grapple with as we go through because we had people uh, who supported the nuclear industry telling us well, you should make sure you tell both sides. There's two sides to this thing. Tell both sides. And at some some point, Mike, the director, got frustrated with that thinking that there's this sort of this both sides because they seem so unequal. Where you had one side that was uh, making a lot of money ex extracting uranium, had a big budget for advertising propaganda, uh, and you had another side that was local communities forming uh, activist groups and networking and educating each other with very little budget, and so. I think, you know, that's what people are maybe responding to. I think through the process of um, the larger one, we went around the whole province, we were at public meetings, so we, we filmed a lot of it. And it was, it was interesting at first because the first one we were at, the people thought we were the government filming the, the <laughs> consultations. So they were actually angry at us for a minute. They were like, what are you guys filming? Like, I didn't agree to be filmed. Like, we're independent filmmakers. We're here documenting this process. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think that the fact that we were independent and didn't have funding from any of the government or the industry may have allowed people to be a bit more comfortable having us film. But in terms of this, the solidarity between like Northern Saskatchewan and Ontario, I'm not sure how how much of a connection is there. I, I think it'd be useful to build that though. I, I, um, Arperg actually gave us a, a grant to do a bit of a bit of the work on the full length. And I, I think maybe through the perks is maybe a good opportunity to to bridge some of that stuff. I was asking just because we have um, one of our working groups is called the Environmental Justice Working Group, and they're starting to do some work around the Line Nine um, pipeline that's going through. And it's actually like there's part of the pipeline is really close to the university, um, and part of uh, like it goes through bit bar parts of Toronto, so. Part of that campaign, we're working with some different groups on campus, is to try to make awareness about it, and it comes from from the tart, like it's coming from that direction. So um, that's just that's why I was wondering, is the in terms of the connections. I know there's a whole bunch of people in Toronto working on these kind of things, and they have connections with people in various communities. But that's I, I was just wondering. Well, it's interesting too, just the connection between tar sands and the nuclear industry. The proposals in Saskatchewan in 2009 came out of the uh, the government wanting to build nuclear reactors on the Alberta border to export electricity to the tar sands. And so the nuclear proposal was really in support of the tar sands work. And it definitely links. Uh, yeah, but yeah, hopefully we can keep building networks. <laughs> and they're both about, I mean, it's interesting thinking of those comparisons too, because they're both kind of about we're not very good at thinking about long term yeah. you know and the fact that we're using uranium which has a lifespan of a million years i mean it's just to even think that you can control it underground or that you know there's not earthquakes or tremors or what if everybody dies because of climate change who's going to look out or you know i mean there's just so many unpredictable things that could happen so this notion that we can rationally plan to look after it for a million years, like what is the world going to look like? Or in, you know, a hundred years or two hundred years, things will have changed drastically. And you know, I think it's very similar to the problem with climate change: is we're leaving all these legacies behind, which have very, very long-term effects. And you know, as far as climate change is concerned, irreversible effects. You know, we can't turn it around; it's too late. And so I think, you know, as a culture we have to start imagining different kinds of ways of thinking about time and different kinds of ways about the legacies that we're leaving now. And but I think that's the parallel between nuclear waste and why are we even doing 
Well, that's it's interesting that what I'm doing in my PhD program is I'm going to work on a hopefully a, a process to create a vision for a renewable energy grid in Saskatchewan and a vision for what an economy would look like in Saskatchewan that was run on nuclear energy um, because I think that's that's the part we need to look at. So I, I worked with Peter Victor who has written a book Managing Without Growth and he, he's questioned our focus on growing the economy forever because it means that probably we're going to be growing our energy use forever which doesn't seem very possible in an era of extreme oil and even if you switch to renewables you wouldn't want to keep growing your energy needs because you you suddenly have a, a world full of wind turbines or solar panels so I think uh, yeah the need for another vision is something I see as quite important and that we'll hopefully be able to contribute to with PhD work. Footage of that, or was the, no. those actors too? Those are actors. It just it seemed yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, good, that was great, yeah. fantastic. That's what I was wondering. No, that was shot in the studio mm -hmm. at York, mm -hmm. and that was I don't know Peter Callahan. He's a quite famous Canadian actor, so he plays mm -hmm. the guy that you hear in voiceover. Okay. But it was sort of thinking about Anne Ron and you know, mm -hmm. and that was I guess that was the thing that always astonished me about the ducks was that you know you had all the, the activism around the tar sands and people trying to raise awareness about you know downstream there's elevated cancer rates and we know it's contributing to climate change and Canada's you know pariah at every uh, climate convention but what really seemed to move people were these ducks mm -hmm. who uh, and you know it was interesting because when it was reported it was 500 ducks who they caught and it was based on this this was a true story that a worker had actually captured some of those images on a cell phone and it went viral because Sintru knew it would be a public relations disaster and it was a public relations disaster for them I mean it really was reported all over the world and they had to quickly you know move into spin but that was sort of what interested me about it too is how ecological disasters can be quickly turned into public relations uh, campaigns, which was what, what happened. I mean, it's like the Deepwater Horizon, exactly the same thing happened. And we have short memories, so we forget about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Deepwater was like two years ago? Yeah, two years ago. <laughs> well, BP had a $20 million campaign immediately after it, and, um, you know, that's saying, the beaches are safe, the seafood is safe, come on back, we're back, you know, it's fine. Come. Well, you just have to walk on a beach there, and you'll find tar balls. Mm -hmm. There was Hurricane Isaac, which just happened, was that September? Or, yeah, I think it was September. Um, predictably stirred up all of these tar mats and tar balls that were on the bottom of the ocean. We had friends who went out to some of the barrier islands in Alabama. They were again coated. This, that had been one of the epicenters from the deep water horizon. They were again coated with oil. So it's not, you know, the, the uh, statistics are that they got maybe anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the oil and the rest of the oil was sunk to the bottom, or it's you know it's in the air. It's a very it's a really really toxic area right now. Um, people are very very ill because of that mixture of dispersant and um, oil, which is dispersant is bad enough, oil is bad enough. But when you put the two together, it's like this terrible double whammy. And there's going to be huge cancer rates that are that are going to happen down there as well that are happening right now. Um, well, the responses have been good, and they've, you know, uh, Carpe Jam was on Bravo TV, and we're just starting to sort of launch Dead Ducks was at Planet in Focus, so that was really great. It won an award at a film festival, and, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to start working with people who have campaigns around the tar sands, uh, that they could use it for free. We're going to post it on Vimeo, and it'll be there for people to use, so that's really what we're hoping. And yeah, no, I'm lucky to be in a position where I can access university resources too, because otherwise, who would fund this stuff? Nobody. In terms of, well, our, our editing yeah, has occurred pretty low budget. We had some funding from ARPERC, which was great. So there was a bit of an affiliation with the University of Regina's community. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work on part of the project as part of my PhD studies. Um, it's my committee. I can focus on uh, the film for a comprehensive uh, requirement. I uh, hope that that happens. They'll, they'll help get some more progress made. Uh, but yeah, we're at the stage now, we've, we've got, well, we've nearly got a, a trailer that we'll start to use to apply for funding. Uh, yeah, we've had, there's a film 
pool cooperative in Regina, so they've been helpful. We've been able to uh, get some in-kind equipment from them sometimes. Um, we probably should, it'd be nice to maybe we should talk to some universities to, to get some more help on this thing. You could try crowdsourcing. Crowd, yeah. I mean, I could talk to you about some of that stuff. That'd be great. It's yeah. now a way that people are funding low-budget documentaries. Yeah. That's what we're thinking if we get a good trailer. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for organizing. And, uh, yeah, that was great seeing you. So.